Okay, so uh, now you've had a little bit of an introduction. So now let's, uh, let's start with, uh, well, the lecture module as such. And uh, we're gonna use immediately these uh, Flickr devices. Um, and I'll tell you in a little bit how they work. So hopefully they, they will really work. Uh, so the first thing, what we're gonna ask ourselves is colloid. What is a colloid? Now it's a bit of a funny word. And uh, it comes from the Greek word kola, and then some guy just added the word oit. And uh, this guy happened to be Thomas Graham, and he did that in the 19th century somewhere. So if you want to read the, one of the first papers that uses the word colloid, there's a reference, Journal of Chemical Society, London, 1864. These things are pretty cool to read. Uh, you might as well be aware that Google Books, for example, anything that's out of copyright, so anything that's, you know, 1920s and before is free of copyright. So you can leave the PDFs and the Kindle versions and the, uh, the iPad versions all online and Google Books does this. So you can read the original manuscripts from Einstein, from Putnam, from Vanatov, all these guys from Newton, it's all available online. So you might wanna have a look and to see uh, how good these guys actually were. So, okay, classical definition of a colloid. It's actually really simple. It's one face dispersed in another face. And, um, but that's not only it. So, you know, that, that, that combination of those, of those two phases has to have a certain stability, right? If I would take oil and water and I would shake it in an, in an Erlenmeyer flask and then, uh, stop shaking, then quite quickly it ripens into an oil face and a water face, and depending on the density, one is on top of the other, yeah? But in this case, for example, a nice example here, you have oil and water, you have milk. So you have oil droplets dispersed in water, and milk is happy being milk. There is no layer of oil floating on top of the water, well, at least not until you go way past the uh, expiry date of your milk and then it all goes horribly wrong and you'll end up with a mess. But why you end up with the mess is also very interesting. Yeah, basically you'll introduce a colloidal instability. And because of the colloidal instability, the stuff starts to cream and the oil starts to float on top and you get lots of bits in it, which is called coagulum. And then you'll end up with a clear water face. So that's what you want to do if you want to make cheese or yogurt or something, you'll induce the same thing on top. So now um, let's, uh, let's see what your opinion is about, uh, about this other uh, thing there and let's see whether it's going to work. So there's two answers possible. So uh, let us look at two ideal gases, gas A and gas B. Can we prepare a colloid of gas A dispersed in gas B or gas B dispersed in gas A. So can I make a colloid out of two gases, two ideal gases? Answer A is no, and answer B is yes. And let's see how this is gonna develop itself. So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about this. I have 31 responses, 65% says no, 35% says, yes, you can change your mind if you want, just by pressing the other button. But you know, you wanna to stick to your answers, right? Stick to your guns, basically. So, uh, okay, so it's changing. 60 says no, and about 40 says yes. So why is it no, or why is it yes? Who, who, who wants that, who has the guts to air his opinion? Anybody? Anybody voting for the no camp? Why? Okay, okay, and, who, and who's uh, voting for the yes camp? Who's gonna counter that argument? People are, yeah? You reckon, you reckon? So. With, with a colloid, the answer is basically you always have to have you always have to have two two faces basically, yeah. And if you look at gases, 
uh, things might become a little bit more tedious. So let's let's have a closer look at this, right? So so gases, ideal gases. Uh, the definition of an ideal gas is that one, they don't have a volume. Yeah, they're a point, a point, and that's it. And the second, more important thing in this case is they also do not interact with each other. Yeah, so the molecules don't interact with each other. So there are no attractions between molecules A, no attractions between molecules B, and also no repulsions. Yeah, which basically means it's just a random box of ping pong balls. Yeah. Now, in order to have a colloid, you have to have two phases, which means you have to have attractive forces between molecules A and attractive forces between molecules B. Otherwise, you'll end up with one phase. The one phase, in this case, is just a mixture of molecules A and B. There is no phase separation. Yeah? And you may remember, or may not remember, a long time ago, for some thermodynamics here, one, that for ideal gases, mixing is only entropy-driven. And if entropy would prevail, if entropy is the winner, then everything would mix. Yeah? And in case of ideal gases, this is true. So if I would plot the Helmholtz uh, free energy, which is valid for constant volume, and it's a lattice-based theory people use for this, you can see that um, the first derivative of this is always negative. So... Yeah, you basically fall under zero, or the, you know, the energy all the energy sorry the energy falls always under zero, and as a result of that, you always promote mixing. Yeah, not the first derivative, the energy. So um, answer A um, was uh, the correct answer. So 60% of people had it right. Okay. So let's have a look. What is possible then? So let's just change the, the nature of the phases. So the continuous phases are on the horizontal uh, bit of the column and the, uh, of, of the table, and the dispersed phases are uh, in the vertical bit. So uh, to disperse a gas in a gas, well, that always mixes. We've just established that. So that, that's got nothing to do with color. So if I would disperse a gas into a liquid, you'll make foam, yeah? bubble bath or something. Uh, shaving cream is a nice example. Whipped cream is a nice example. Um, if I would disperse a gas into a solid, I end up with a solid foam. So uh, pernus, this is natural stone that you can buy. If you have like, you know, a dodgy skin, you can kind of rub it off with a, with a porous stone like that. Or styrofoam, coffee cups. Yeah, it's basically polystyrene with, with uh, air pockets in it, so it insulates better, so heat transfer goes slower. So a liquid in a gas, tiny liquid droplets in a gas, would be mist, which is like an aerosol. Hairspray, for example, is an example. Fog is an example. A liquid in a liquid, so liquid A dispersed in liquid B, would be an emulsion. We've seen an example already. Milk. Yeah. Another example, mayonnaise. Uh, liquid in a solid. So the continuous phase is as a solid-like structure. A gel. It's a bit more difficult to define. So you'll have a network of agar or gelatin, which acts like a solid. And in there, dispersed in there, is a liquid phase. Um, a solid in a gas. It's a solid aerosol, so if you have very, very fine powder, you just, you know, blow it in the air. Then you have solid particles dispersed in air, which is a solid aerosol. If you have a solid in a liquid, so you have solid particles in a liquid, the classical word of that is a sol, but it, it can vary a little bit here and there. And a solid in a solid is also possible, so you have one solid, and then the continuous phase also turns into a solid, and then you'll end up with fun glasses, like cranberry grass or... I'll show you a nice example of, uh, of one of these things a little bit later in a, in a very, very nice classical example of a colloidal system. Okay. So here are some interesting characteristics. 
So we see it's one phase dispersed in another phase, and uh, sometimes you get very intriguing properties. So the bulk properties of both of these phases sometimes are preserved, but sometimes you get new properties. So here you see uh, gold particles, tiny little gold particles dispersed in a solvent. And uh, in figure number one, uh, the numbers in figure number one are the particle sizes. And you can see that the color changes. It's all gold dispersed in a solvent. But the only thing that changes is the size distribution and the average size of the particles. And you get a different color. That's not something you would get if you would just look at a block of gold and you cut it into two, right? So there is something that if you make stuff small, you might get new properties that you're unaware of. So now the question is, well, how big are colloids? What is a color? How big are things? Well, it's very difficult to define that. So you could say, well, okay, anything from, say, two nanometer up to a few microns. And why do I pick two nanometer as a bottom scale? Well, if it's smaller, you're almost at a, a molecular level. That's yeah, like it's almost a single molecule or like a cluster of a few atoms. It's on the edge there, really. Yeah. And then a few microns. Well, the definition there is like if gravity starts to kick in, you maybe no longer want to call you may, you're on the edge of the colloidal boundaries. So, you know, if, if, if I have my gold bar and I chuck it into water, the density of gold is, what, 19 point something. Obviously, it falls down really quickly. Yeah? Now, the question is, when, when does this size no longer become, you know, when, when is gravity no longer the most dominant force? So you can see here, you know, these colloidal particles of gold in a solvent, they're pretty happy. They don't all fall down because then obviously you will lose the colors as well. So when gravity starts to be neglected, that's the top scale roughly of colloidal matter. Okay, so let's have a look at um, people that were really good at this stuff. Here's the Romans. Nice example. You know, the Lycurgus cup, late Roman, fourth century. Um, they made this beautiful glass cup. And uh, if you would take uh, the picture in reflective mode, so reflective light, you kind of get a green tint of the glass. Whereas if you would take it in transmission mode, so you'll basically let the light go through it, so a light source behind it, for example, and you take a, a picture of whatever comes through it, then it looks red. And... Um, People were baffled by this for ages. Why, why could this happen? You know, like all kinds of weird explanations until they had a tiny, tiny little piece of this glass and they did some studies on it. And uh, there's a really nice uh, review on this in the, on, the ref, on the reference there if you want to read more about it. But basically what solved it was that they, they took a picture of the glass, a TM picture, and in the glass what they found was an alloy of gold and silver nanoparticles, particles that were, you know, 50, 60, 70 nanometer. And they were basically dispersed throughout the glass matrix. So you'll have a solid in a solid, yeah? And the behavior of those particles, the scattering of those particles, caused a difference in refractive and transmission colors. So it's really cool. And this is like, you know, 380. So the question is, can we find something older? The Egyptians, yeah? The Egyptians were clever enough already to use uh, nanoparticles of soot, so just black chalk, well, black, black carbon-based material, and they dispersed it in gum arabic. Gum arabic is kind of a natural, actually, it's a very, very good uh, stabilizer in a way, to stabilize uh, carbon-based materials in water, for example. So you could argue that this is a waterborne paint, yeah? And they just painted this on their, uh, on the, on their paper, which is 1200 BC, 1200 years before Christ. Now you might think, well, that's kind of clever, but here's an even cooler one. The same Egyptians used uh, quantum dots. 
in order to dye their hair black. So you might think, okay, you know, you might dye your hair and uh, you buy your nice little bottle from L'Oreal or Unilever. If you want to have nanotechnology, you go back to the Egyptians. And, uh, and they literally found these, these, these quantum dots clusters in, in the hair fibers. So uh, you might want to argue whether to have these little dots in your hair, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but it's only one way to find out, I would say. Okay, so now we come to a point, the importance of surface area. Yeah, so here's a question for you guys. And I want you to digest this for a little bit and think about it and try to, and try to solve it. How many football pitches? So we'll call that M of uh, now camp. So FC Barcelona Football Club, there's a picture of the stadium, which has an area of 105 by 68 meters. Can we cover with a monolayer of monodispersed spherical particles of a diameter of 100 nanometer? Eh? The total amount of particles is one kilo. To keep it simple, we're gonna uh, assume a density of a uh, 1,000 kilo per cubic meter. So. Um, and P stands in, in, in these four options. P stands for the packing density of the particles. So you might want to think about that a little bit. So how many football pitches, uh, or maybe even a fraction of it, right? A kilo roughly would be, you know, you know, one carton of milk. That's the amount you've got, right? That's the football pitch. And you have to think whether with that one, one kilo of material, can you cover, yes or no, the entire football pitch, or can you cover more than one football pitch? So let's do a let's do a quick uh, a quick poll. If uh, just say, who thinks I can cover? Press A if you think I can cover more than one football pitch. Press B if you're saying, no way, I'll only be a little bit. Before we go, uh, people all press A saying like, yes, you can. But come on, it's, it's a tiny amount, right? One little, little bit of paint. See the poor guy with the, with the yellow lines, you know, on his big machine. Okay. So, okay, 94% says that you can cover more than one. Opinions are changing slowly but surely. Okay, okay, okay. So let's, uh, let's stop this and let's think about this a little bit more in detail. So I'll give you a few minutes to, uh, to have a go at this. And then we'll get back to it. <laughs> 